Wonderful. Thank you. Good evening. evening. It's good to see each one of you, and we welcome you to our service. Uh, Each one of you, as you've gathered together today to uh, worship and uh, gather on this Maundy Thursday, I'm so used to on this evening to uh, call it Love Feast and join in the various segments that are very special to us, but it is still a, a significant and memorable time for us as his children, as followers and disciples of Jesus, because we come together and uh, uh, we know as we live our lives that there's, there's questions that we don't have answers to, but certainly in the upper room as the disciples met, as Jesus was trying to prepare them, as he was preparing himself uh, to soon uh, go and provide salvation and to go and, and die on that Roman gibbet that, at Calvary at Golgotha. And, but they're disciples. Just think of that in the evening. All the questioning, all the things that the scriptures unfold for us. It's uh, a memorable time, but it's significant for us because thousands of years later, we still gather, we still honor him. We take a moment to pause and to, not in a hurried fashion, but to share together, to look in God's word and, and see the specialness of what Jesus was sharing and what will help us as we move through uh, and up to Good Friday and Triumph of Resur- Resurrection Day. But it's good to be together. Glad you're here. And as you are, I would ask you to stand our opening hymn, Marvelous Grace of Our Loving Lord. <clears throat> I so much appreciate uh, your singing. It's beautiful. As I think of grace, it just moves me. 
And I hope it does this evening all that God brought. You may be seated. As you note, uh, as our habits, a good habit, the uh, offering plates are in the back. And so at this time, in response to the giving this evening, uh, Pam and Joyce will have an a offertory number. Let us, let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that your love, your love is so amazing, so divine. As the old hymn writer said so many years ago, it demands our life, all of our strength, everything we have. Lord, with us this evening to honor you, to, to come together and gather in your name. And thanking you as we think of those special times that you had so long ago with those closest to you, to have them to not only recognize and understand, but to under, un, be a part of what is going to come very shortly upon helping them to understand and help them to carry on with that great mission. And Lord, today we thank you that we are all together, all because of your grace. Lord, bless uh, this evening. Thank you for the offering and the receiving of the gifts. Lord, your good hand of blessing upon them, and we give you thanks and praise in your name. Amen. Once again, uh, let's share in When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
Any, uh, before we just have a time of prayer together, uh, any special uh, joys, uh, answers to prayer that you may want to voice and express at this time? Any answers to prayer? That's wonderful, yes. Yeah, we're so happy, everything could have been worse, as we so often say, yes. Yeah. And I, as well, uh, extend to you, my church family, for your continual prayers and your thoughts. And uh, Julie, Julie just put the words so, so uh, amazing up. I can read them. I can see them. It's all because of Julie. I mean, she, nah. She, she does it wonderfully, and we appreciate Julie very much. Uh, but I can see them clearly. So the blurriness is going. So thank you for your prayers, and I do praise God for it. And, and thanks for Baton, too. <laughs> he knows what he's doing. <laughs> so we'll keep up whenever the other eye will come for it. But I am so thankful for your, your uh, care and your thoughts and prayers. It means a lot. And it's a special prayer we know every day. We continue to think of Trudy. I know her and the family uh, say, oh, there, there, there's a pastor mentioned again. But we, we love him dearly, and we know it's important uh, because God says we're to be persistent and we're to continually. So uh, that's right and proper for us to continue to, to pray and remember. So we're grateful for what God is doing. We really are, and may that continue. And may great, great miracle come. And that's what we're holding on to. We have been praying and just mentioned this evening for Larry and Crystal Reber. Uh, Larry had surgery, uh, should be home this evening and uh, uh, to, to uh, remove a, a blockage. And everything went well. Uh, but pray for both Crystal and Larry. And for those in the nursing home, for Jean and uh, for Clark, for uh, Helen. Uh, remember each, each one. Uh, for uh, Dave's uh, sister, Linda, and uh, for Peggy, and, uh, and Ridge. Uh, remember them especially this evening. Jo join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening once again as we've gathered together. We thank you that uh, we are here and that you already know before we ask, but it's so special for us to gather corporately and collectively in prayer. And it's only through the name and the wonderful way through our Lord Jesus Christ that there's any way uh, to, to have answers to prayer. We know that. But we, we just exclaim with great praise for all that you bring to us, the blessing. Thank you for touching Eric and helping him. We, we know that sometimes we, we, we know your scripture says that there are angels that uh, uh, that, that spiritual uh, hasn't opened up, but there are angels that are that are doing, working, and striving. We don't see that. And some of the things, Lord, they prevent things. Sometimes they uh, buffer the situation. But we thank you that, uh, that Eric was not hurt uh, worse than what he was feeling. We thank you for the speedy recovery and all that you're doing for he and the family. And thank you for Trudy and continue, Lord. Uh, we know you're holding her, and we know that there's a specialness of your touch upon her, that you're going to meet it out in, in wonderful ways to your glory and honor. And so we thank you for that. Uh, we certainly think of Larry and Trustee's home and Crystal. Help her as uh, so many things with Larry's health has uh, uh, needed attention as of late. And so we pray your care for him and uh, for the doctor's instructions that he will have to abide by and follow. And we know that's a difficult uh, course uh, to follow in, uh, in our life. But we pray that uh, through Crystal's attentiveness and uh, persistence that it might be a, a great way for Larry to feel much better and to, to be relieved of some of the things that he's been going through as of late. We pray and trust that Ridge is uh, receiving uh, great care, and Lord, for his family and uh, wife and daughter and all those attending. May, may things continue improving for him in wonderful ways. Uh, we uh, think of Clark and, and Helen, and just thank you for the, uh, certainly the, the care and all the, the staff and, and family, and uh, just trust that, uh, that you'll help him with the, the moments 
uh, that there are lapses and the moments where uh, things may be a little difficult. Uh, help uh, Sherry, Sherry uh, uh, Lord, and Roger and the family uh, uh, as they may sense that and as they able to converse. It, it, it causes sometimes really difficulty uh, when things aren't uh, the way they should be. But we, that's why we lift in prayer. And we certainly uh, uh, remember Max and, uh, and for Jean. Uh, we think of as Max is, is away and uh, not able to get in. Uh, hopefully that will be soon. But uh, take care of him and uh, fill his days that, that are normally with just love and care and closeness with Jean, that, uh, that you'll fill them with, with uh, not a void, but with your presence and also others that are able to gather and, and just uh, give him some conversation and some time. Lord, we uh, thank you so much as we think of so many others in our church family and into our community. This evening, Lord, we thank you for the time that we have. And the Lord, continue to bless. Bless each one as they just love you and are obedient to you. And may, Lord, as we open your word, Lord, this evening, that you'll uh, heighten those things uh, of you and your word that will help us to uh, follow a little closer and a little deeper with our Lord. In his wonderful name we do pray. Amen. One verse of scripture this evening, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, and I know you have, have been sitting for a little while, but I could ask you to stand. It's one verse, and uh, to read one verse. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace, that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. You may be seated and may God bless his word. This morning, this evening, I just want to give you and draw your attention and give your attention to the most significant fundamental fact of Christianity. You see, the cross, the cross of Jesus Christ was not only the blackest hour for mankind, but it was the brightest hour. Think with me, the cross of Jesus Christ was the blackest hour because it was that point in history, the most heinous, despicable crime that has ever been heaped and committed upon our Lord. But it also, the cross of Calvary for mankind was the brightest moment because it was that, that moment that God and his love, think with me, God and his love blossomed full flower. And there we had the scent of forgiveness Remember the words of our Lord where he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Do you realize that, that Calvary is the crossroads of Christianity? Those that came before it looked to it and pointed to it, and those of us who have been privileged to live af after it point back to it as the time or the symbol where we as men and women receive hope, hope. Brothers and sisters, hope, because we were most men and women most miserable because of the sin which had been in our lives. And so this evening, it's great joy for me because I'm focusing on one of the most beautiful words, one of the most beautiful words that you can think of, because you may say to me tonight, well, you know, the most beautiful word and the most powerful word is love, but no. There's a word that is one step higher than love. You see, it's the word forgiveness. The word forgiveness. And that word forgiveness is what I want to talk about. Because it says in here, it is through Christ himself and through his blood that we are forgiven. And, our, and we are redeemed and our sins are forgiven and therefore, what? He lavished, he freely bestowed his grace upon us, upon us. Just think with me. Forgiveness. It's that word forgiveness that we remind of the words of our Lord as John said, Here, herein is love. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that God loved us and paid the price 
for all our sin. Use the big word propitiation, but it means atonement. Paid for all our sin. You see, love is forgiveness in action. Love is what? Voluntarily climbing on a cross. It's that word forgiveness that heightens everything in our life. You see, in the word forgiveness, we have God's wisdom. We have God's goodness. We have God's ability, not only his grace, but ability to lay down his life. And so not only is it the most beautiful word, the word forgiveness, but it also is the costliest word. Think with me. The word forgiveness is the costliest word because before God could ever pronounce it, Christ had to die for it. Before God thought of it, Christ died for it because we know that God not only created us and knew us before the foundation of the world, but he already had a plan set in place. It wasn't an afterthought that Adam and Eve sinned and the fall happened and we're and all humanity's lost that, well, now what do I do? No, he already had. That's God. And so it's a great thing to remember of forgiveness. Love, oh, it's wonderful, but without that forgiveness. You see, forgiveness has no touch upon us if it weren't for the cross of Calvary. Forgiveness would not mean anything without the cross of Calvary. And so I want to take that word forgiveness and just two thoughts tonight. The first is kind of maybe a little lengthy, but I hope that you'll to understand and see this point of it. As we think of forgiveness and think of that measure of forgiveness that God gave, I want you to think with me. It's not the character of the offender. It's not the character of the sinner. It's not the character of you. It's not the character of me, which is the determining of the forgiveness that we're hoping for or wanting in our life. It's not your character. It's not my character that determines that. It's the character of the offended one. And the offended one is God. Our sin that we commit to God, we were born in sin. And so that's an offense to the holy, mighty God, isn't it? It's an offense to it. And that's why God had a plan to send Jesus. He was born. And because he came and, and, and he died upon a cross, and in his death, there is a new way. There is now another avenue. There is another way. No longer are we estranged, separated. No longer is there a bridge. It has now been gapped because, as Timothy says, as Paul told Timothy, that there's only one mediator between God and man, and that is the man Christ Jesus. So it's not your character. It's not my character that determines that. It's the character of the offended one, and the offended one is God. For example, in school, I don't know if... uh, if uh, Isaac and Caleb, Abigail, if you studied uh, Richard the Lionhearted. Richard the Lionhearted, those of you who studied him, that uh, king of majesty of England, he went away uh, for uh, extended time, and he had a brother named John. And while Richard was away, John, John did all types of terrible, despicable things against Richard. Now, Richard was the Lionhearted. Why was he called the lion-hearted? Because he had a big forgiving heart. Big forgiving heart. And the offenses that John heaped upon Richard were terrible. But Richard forgave him. That's why he was called the lion-hearted. So just as Richard's the lion-hearted, John was the squirrel-hearted. He didn't have anything in his heart of forgiveness. And so, so the forgiveness that is hoped for in our life is not determined by what you in your life or what I in my life is happening or going on or in that. It's not determined by that. The forgiveness that is likely or unlikely to happen is not so much upon the offense and the forgiveness that we're wanting for, right, is upon the fence or the things that we have done, but it's because of the person who has been offended has done that. And because Richard had a big forgiving heart, he forgave John. But just think with me. If John, if John had done, if Richard had done what 
to John what John did to Richard, Richard would never <laughs> be forgiven. And so it's, it's not the size of the offense. It's not the heaviness of the sin. But it's the heart of the person who's been offended, the person that has been hurt grossly and just. Think with me tonight. Have you not heard of people that, that something small, just so insignificant, and for the next 20, 30 years, they say how they had been wronged, and I'm not talking to them, and, and I'm over here, and I'm not going to talk to them, and I'm bitter, and I'm angry, and I have strife, and I'm not going to do it. And you look, and you scratch their head, and it was just so small. It was just so little. Was it the heaviness of the offense? Was it the size of the sin? No. It was the size and the heart of the person who forgive. Most offenses of people that commit in their life is, is not what they themselves have been affected by. But the forgiveness that happens is because the person who's been offended has a big forgiving heart and, and to forgive them. But have you known people like that? But then how about their people who have been grossly injusted, grossly taken advantage of, been viciously attacked? And all of a sudden you look and go, how... How did they ever forgive them? Is it the size of the sin? Is it the heaviness of the offense? No. No. Most matters of forgiveness do not depend upon the person who's committed the sin or the offense or situation. Most matters of forgiveness depend upon the person who's been offended. And that's the good news tonight because we have God the lion-hearted. We have God the lion-hearted, the one who said what? If Adam and Eve will reject and willfully sin against me, I will go and he looked for them. And what did he say? He said, Adam, where are you? Who God says, if man will turn his back on me, I will find a way and I have found a way and I will let my son die on a cross and pay the penalty of their sin because I will give another roadway, another path for mankind to come back to me. That's the God. That's the God that we have. Don't listen to the world out there that says God doesn't care and God does not know and God's not attentive and God isn't. Don't listen to the specious interpretations of people and their opinions and thought. Don't listen to that. We have a God we worship as a God of grace, a God that loves all mankind, a God who has laid down his life for all people. But it's up to each person to make that choice. God will never, and he's never went and forced my will, and he, won't, and he hasn't forced your will, and he won't force anybody. But think with me tonight. Think with me of the forgiveness that he has given to you at the cost of his own blood. So that's why it's a beautiful word, but it's costly in the midst of it because we have a God that his mercy endures forever his mercy endures forever. think with me all you mercy limited people out there tonight come on now mercy limited people right you know, aren't you some of you come on now if you're honest at some point in your life you've been like Peter right this evening Lord how many times do I have to forgive them Come on, give, give me a number, Lord. How many? Because I got a few neighbors of mine. They're pretty close. They're pretty quota, right? Yeah. We think of that. You know, there's a passage in First Chronicles. You look at your leisure in chapter 21. God's mercy endures forever. His mercy. Think of that. His grace. I'm telling you. We don't, you can't buy that. You can't earn that. You receive it. You, God offers it. But his mercy, it's amazing. But one time, David illegally, irresponsibly, he was supposed to take the census, but he, he disobeyed. He illegally did it. And in 1 Chronicles 21, what did, what did God say to David? Remember? He said to da David, a curse is going to come upon you. Because you did not obey me. You illegally did it. You willfully did it. And he says, I'll give you a choice. 
Do you want to fall into the hands of your enemies? Do you want to fall into the hands of man? Or do you want to fall into my hands, the hands of God? And in there, in there David said, please, please, Lord, let me fall into your hands that are so great of mercy. But don't let me fall into the hands of my enemies or mankind. Have you ever think? I can think through the years. There, are, there were situation times I would not want to fall in the hands of man. I would not want to fall in the hands of my enemies. I'd rather fall in the hands of, of God because his hands are filled with great mercy. And that's the good news tonight because God's mercy and God's grace has no limits. And it's for all mankind. But you know what? We sometimes take things for granted, and we believe we live in like a privileged place. Let me close with the story. You may have heard it. It's the story of Jimmy and Sally. Jimmy and Sally, during the summer, looked with great anticipation to go to Grandma and Grandpa's house on the farm. And it was a highlight for them during the summer to go on the farm. And... uh, So as they are there enjoying the time, uh, grandfather gave Jimmy a slingshot. And uh, so he decided to take it out uh, in the field and, and, you know, practice. And so he took a stone and put it in the web of the slingshot. And he's uh, he's not doing so well. He's not hitting the target. So he's kind of frustrated. And he begins to walk back uh, to the house, to the farmhouse, and uh, he's mad, he's frustrated, and so he looks over and he sees Grandma's pet duck. And, uh, you know, he hadn't hit anything, right? So he figured, wow, so he, he's over in the direction of the, of the duck and he shoots and boom, we have a dead duck. Jimmy goes, oh, what am I going to do? So uh, he goes over, takes the duck, goes behind a wood pile, you know, and covers it up and hides it, and as he turns around, there's Sally. (laughs) And he knows that she knows, and so they go in uh, the farmhouse. And after a little while, Grandma says, Sally, would you like to help with the dishes? And and Sally says, no, I think Jimmy would would gladly do the dishes. And uh, Sally went over to him in his ear and said, remember the duck. I'll do the dishes, Grandma. It was time for supper, and uh, Grandpa said, uh, Jimmy, let's, uh, I want to take you fishing. Let's go fishing before we have supper tonight. And uh, Sally says, oh, uh, uh, Sally says, oh, Jimmy, J- uh, Jimmy has uh, to help Grandma with the, the supper tonight. I'll go fishing with you, Grandfather. And uh, so she goes fishing. And he helps with the supper. This went on about four or five days, and Jimmy couldn't take it because he's doing his chores, and he's doing Sally's chores. And it came to a breaking point, and he goes in the kitchen, and there's Grandma. He says, Grandma, and he repents. He says, I killed your duck. I didn't mean to. I was just pointing over there. I wasn't hitting any the target. I'm sorry. I repent. I didn't mean to do it. And she says, it's okay, Jimmy. It's okay. She goes... I saw what you did. I was looking out the kitchen window, and I I saw the whole thing. She says, but Jimmy, what I was waiting for and what I was wondering is how long you were going to be a slave to Sally before you were going to confess and get, get that all taken care of. Brothers and sisters, your name's written in Lamb's Book of Life. You're his child. You're his But you know, just as Sally gets in the ear of that, sometimes there are Christians that lost the joy of their salvation. They've lost the peace. They've lost the happiness. Instead of confessing it and getting it out and taking care of that, because that's what we're to do. This evening as we go to the table and we partake of the bread and cup, 1 John 1, 9 is a wonderful promise. It says that if we're, if, because he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we're still sinners saved by grace. 
But if, we, if I have the attitude that, well, you know, I, you know, other people do that. That's not a big deal. I mean, oh, you know, what's the big deal about that thing? And I think tonight you know that. But there are some like that that every time they begin to try to serve, every time they try to have the joy in their life and happiness, the adversary comes and reminds them of that. Just as Sally reminded Jimmy of the duck, we've got to be quick to confess those sins because we're not without sin. We're not without struggles and temptation. But when we immediately, when God knows and we tell him, it's not that we presume, it's that it's, we're open. But if we hide things behind and say, well, you know, everybody does that and so forth, I think you know that. The more that we're pliable, the more that we're confessing that because God's grace is not that we presume and take advantage and just, well, I'll say this and then I'm going to live anyway. No, you know that because you have maturity to your faith, right? But what I'm saying this evening is to remember God's grace, his wonderful grace, because It's beyond what we could comprehend. And so the forgiveness, what we receive, it's you can't buy it through gold or mountains of tears, but you freely receive it. And that's what it is. But as we walk and journey with them, I hope that you'll have a constant sense that when we fall short, and we do, I do, fall short. But God is there to help us. And at times he he heightens our closeness to him, that we're quick in those times. So as we go to the table today, does each one have the cup this evening? Everyone have one? Okay. Okay. Well, they'll pass, Anne, and, uh, and while they're passing out, let me read the passage in 1 Corinthians. And then following this time around the table, then we'll sing our closing hymn. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, very familiar passage of Scripture. Paul said, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. And further down it says, But if we judge ourselves, we will not come under judgment. For when we are judged by the Lord, we're being disciplined, so we'll not be condemned with the world. So we come to honor him tonight and to remember as we partake of the bread and the cup. As you receive We'll allow each one of you to receive the, uh, the bread and the cup tonight, and then we'll have a moment of silent prayer to prepare ourselves in that. So as it says there, we, we are to have this moment together, and then we're to freely partake together because of his wonderful forgiveness. And so tonight, we want to honor him in and, and have those things up to date. So we'll give a moment, and then we'll have a moment of silent prayer. Let's bow our head and our heart. Lord, in the moments of quietness, how we thank you for your wonderful, all-expansive, 
wonderful forgiveness that as we confess you are faithful, you are so faithful and just, forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you for that through your Holy Spirit. Lord, we honor you tonight now as we partake of the bread and then the cup as we share in these emblems of symbols, Lord, tangible means that represent your broken body and your shed blood. You sustain us, your body broken for us to bring healing, bring healing to those this evening, the fullness, the completeness. Lord, bring sustenance, bring real sustenance to our heart, to our life, not only to this body, but also to the spiritual, that will yearn more for the nuggets of your word, to receive those things that can only come by that. But also, Lord, we thank you for your blood. Without that, there is no forgiveness. There's no hope of heaven. We rejoice tonight in your grace, your love, your forgiveness. It's all because of you. It's all of you and how unworthy we are, but yet we stand, we sit in worthy because you did that. And we're, we're righteous, any righteousness, anything of that is because of you. You live in us. We honor you tonight, and as we partake, bless the bread to our bodies, bless the cup. Lord, thank you for the life you bring, the life you have brought, and the life eternal that we, Lord, one day will be ours. Lord, this evening we have those that we miss and long to be. And one day it will be a reality. And so long as you tarry, we continue to love and serve you and to allow your, your house continue to be a beacon, a part of the mission and all that you have. Bless each one tonight that's a part of that, that loves you and loves your work and your church. May it flourish no matter what goes on around us no matter what it may impede and be a, a try to stop, whatever the world's uh, system will try, yet we know that you said that you, you are building your church. Build it, Lord, upon lives. And even those that you have in mind, Lord, together we give you praise this evening. As we come, Lord, and receive, may you bless. In your name we pray. Amen. Lift the bread and let us share in the words as we share in unison. The bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. cup. The cup which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord. Bless. Thank you, Anne and Dave. Would you stand and join our closing hymn, Hallelujah, What a Savior.
once again we all say together, Hallelujah, what a Savior. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming this evening. God bless you.